And then the thing being that because we're running off like uh, an older generation of vehicles, so they are separated, so we actually have to manually join them together. <coughs> so we've managed to actually, um, for those of you who have been to our bench, you get to see that like, you know, you can control the speedometer. And how we do that is actually via like can injection. So we control some of the infotainment features via can messages that we sniffed over time. So that's where our where we did like reverse engineering and more like black like box testing of sorts. Because we don't obviously don't have the can messages like you know, we, we can't source it out from Google, it doesn't work that way. But what we can do is that we can start to monitor the messages right that it sends and then we can slowly sniff out from there and see what it actually does. <coughs> so what we did here is that we actually did like a man in the middle attack to directly control the canvas itself. Right? So <coughs> the the thing is that if we don't do the man in the middle attack, we can't actually control anything. So in essence like, let's say even if we saw the you know the speedometer move we, we can't actually re like get that, we can't replicate that in itself without doing a manual attack. Like, it will just float out, just block entirely. So that's not going to check out for us. <coughs> so, I think, um, I think after a bit of research, we sort of realized that like, one of the vehicle IDs that we saw was able to control all the critical systems. And it also matched the ID you know, in the cluster meter. So, we sent in the cluster meter, um, what it did is actually it revealed another message within the data packet that was sent and it allowed us to bypass the filtering of source. So that's how we got it to consistently display and do what we wanted. So over here you can actually uh, see like you know the we actually had a rental vehicle. Um, this is actually one of our team members inside the rental vehicle itself. So the reason why we want to do it is that we want to make sure, we want to validate our findings, right, from what we've built inside a test bench. Because sometimes what we do in a test bench might not actually um, replicate out in real life. So that's going to be a problem and we didn't want that to happen. So we rented out a car um, and we also made sure that, you know, uh, whatever that we're doing doesn't actually compromise the safety of the vehicle. So we want to make sure that we can return the rental vehicle, right? I don't want to bring insurance or any unnecessary costs to the rental service itself. So that's that. Um, now the thing being that the test mentioned that we had was based off an, an older vehicle. But the one that we uh, rented is actually the latest generation at that point. Thankfully enough, the care messages didn't really differ. So we're, we're, our findings were still pretty good on that. So that was a very big relief for us. Um, so we realized that, the, that we could connect to the central gateway module via the Ethernet cable and CAN messages. And what also additionally happened with the newer generation is that we found the internal IP address of the vehicle through the gateway module. And, well, because it's a website for any, you get to see all these. Um, and we don't actually see it on the test bench because it's running off an older generation of vehicles. So we also verified that the central gateway module communicates with the manufacturer's internal server uh, periodically, and that particular IP address actually belongs to the vehicle manufacturer uh, in this IP directory. So another interesting thing that we found is that the vehicle does lock the IP address once it's, once we are connected to it. Um, so in a sense, like we kind of had to like keep changing the IP address that we used. Uh, so when we actually accessed this site, we actually did see that we noticed that. Um, the car itself is actually getting closer and closer to being something more like a proper PC that you see at home. Right? It had different uh, Ethernet protocols like FlexRay and Ethernet. So, um, yeah, it's sort of like deviating away uh, into like the standard PCs that you know and love. So, there's that. Yeah. <coughs> Let's move on to bench training. Alright, so. Uh, well, this is the sort of diagram right over here. Uh, we'll go through it a little bit more in depth later on. Uh, especially the arrows that you see. So those are the different protocols that's being used. And so what I can see over here, we didn't bring this uh, with us to uh, Philippines, unfortunately. Uh, but so how test match three came about is that 
we were actually pretty inspired by uh, 360 Group's findings that they announced in uh, 2020 at RSA Black Hat back then. And again, you will see a recurring theme is that we have no budget. <laughs> so we found that you know building our own test match again was much more cost effective and safer. Um, um, well, than doing it on actual people, especially when we meet for the first time, right? We want to make sure that like we don't compromise anyone's safety. So yeah, we chose to build a test match again to simulate the attacks and to learn more about the research that was already done. <coughs> So we completed this test bench in November 2020, and yeah, it's because there are already known findings. Uh, we were just really building upon what was already out there to enhance what we knew, and then to see whether or not we could find anything new in the process. So um, similar to test bench two, the central gateway contains most of the CAN protocols, CAN HMI, so which is the infotainment CAN bus. Uh, can be which is the diagnostics canvas and can be which is the body canvas. <coughs> so I think another thing to add on is actually you can see that like, there's a very small like 3D diagram of that. We actually bought that like afterwards to it's like the central console and it kind of gives us like a view of like what's happening to the vehicle at any one point in time. So like, let's say if we say like open the door and then like, literally it will show that it's opening a door at that point. That's pretty neat because we don't have door to open. So, it was pretty fantastic in a sense. Alright. Okay, so just a quick walkthrough of the different components that we have inside the particular test bench. Uh, we have the instrument cluster. So, the instrument cluster displays the speedometer and the infotainment screen together. So, it also allows for Wi Fi connectivity and it's also well directly connected to the infotainment system. So, the infotainment itself, uh, infotainment system itself, is also pretty interesting because we found that there was an onboard web browser that allowed users to actually surf the internet whilst you're driving. So that also does present a, an additional attack factor that we could use, right? Um, in this case, um, when we talk about the infotainment system that we used, we actually did use something slightly older, which was NTG 5.5, rather than using NTG 6, which was the latest information. Uh, sorry infotainment system at the point of research uh, because first of all that was really not much it. and we did feel that NTG 5.5 was sufficient enough you know, for us to actually perform the research and to better understand the findings itself um, and also we did uh, eventually realise that the real, uh, it actually did run real-time OS as well which was a uh, WinC7 automotive arm OS Alright, so these are the other three components of the telematics. So, um, it's known as Hermes in this particular, uh, with this particular manufacturer, and it provides LTE connectivity to your cell phone, and also does provide the infotainment system with uh, internet connectivity. The EIS, uh, think of it like a firewall, so it's like a filtering system. It whitelists uh, specific like ten messages that it should be allowing through. So. We came to realize that like, sometimes when we spoof the messages because they look malformed, we couldn't actually get it through. Um, yeah, and that was really kind of, I think, I think it was pretty neatly, but yeah, we would um, learn a lot more about it. Yeah. And also, um, we actually bought an additional USB hub. So the interesting thing about the USB hub was that because we powered on the entire like, infotainment system and all, right? And then we saw that it started prompting us and we were like, oh, but please, please like, insert a USB, you know, purchase maps. And we are like, why? <laughs> Shouldn't it already come with maps or something? But like, um, we slowly came to realize that the map service was like a subscription-based service that you actually had to pay for. And we're not doing that. No budget. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, we ended up uh, buying a USB hub and then an SD card, so we just downloaded the maps onto the SD card and just uploaded it in instead, and that worked out. Um, but this also leads us to another point, which is that the USB hub in itself, as because you can upload things to it, it does present us with another attack vector, right? So that's that. Yeah. All right. So uh, earlier I did mention a couple of the uh, what's it called now? A couple of the protocols. So we will go through them one by one. So for can be, so can be is like think of it like the interior canvas. So if you like open the door, 
that's one message sent through candy. Close the door, it's another one. So climate control, stuff like that, all control by it. So that's what can be does. So um, and the next one we're going to go to is Can D. So Can D is a diagnostics uh, canvas. So for those of you with own vehicle, uh, you know, like there's the OB2 port. So when you when like you bring it to like the what's the kind of the car repairs workshop, right? And then they plug in the OB2 cable. So that's what the what that's what like a message from the what's the kind of the debugging module that they have. Sorry, I completely forgot what it was called. Diagnostic tester. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, so it just uses this particular um, protocol to communicate with the car itself. And then lastly, we have the CAN HMI, which is the infotainment canvas. So that's what we see for, like, whatever they see on the cluster meter itself. So think of it as, like, um, it communicates, like, you know, uh, it's an infotainment canvas that displays like, human readable uh, information to the cluster meter and it does allow like, us humans to interact with it. Alright, so this is actually like how it looks like assembling Mesh 3. So you can see that when we say Mesh 3 raw, uh, it's not like sashimi or anything, but it just means that we just got out from like fresh from, the, from eBay, going through garages, stuff like that. And you can see that actually it's like, it's pretty messy, right? Like we still had to reverse engineer like the wiring, we had to buy the wiring itself. We, like just really just hook everything up one by one. Um, you, you should see the amount of times that we burn stuff. It's, it was very nice to them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so eventually um, we also got like a Pelican case to place it in, so that at least it looks pretty, right? Like we can bring everyone across the conferences, it's more mobile in a sense. Um, and so, like, as you can see, you know, like the other guy at her booth, so you can actually see him like, talking about the foam and like, actually like, stuffing it in. Um, and the other guy below, that's actually, if you remember, that's this other guy sitting to the rental vehicle, so that's Edwin, that's our other team member. So he's also, he was also helping us with that, uh, like, a lot through the process. And eventually, um, this is how it looked like a lot better, and nothing melting away, which was fantastic. Yeah. Alright, heading over to Alina now, so continue the rest of it. Okay, thank you, please. Um, so before I continue, I just want to thank Jay for bringing us here in the Rukon team. Um, it's, uh, thank you so much guys for being here. Um, it's a privilege to be here with you guys in the Philippines. Um, so let me continue now. Um, I'll talk about the Canvas Wake Up Sing now. So uh, we covered the challenges that we met on Bench 3. So after we are connected to the infotainment system and the custom meter, we actually um, tried to power up the test bench. Um, but we actually noticed a familiar setting um, is that it refuses to power up. Because um, we noticed that for continental vehicles, it actually uh, requires a wake-up signal. Yeah. So, um, but when we power it up, one thing that we found out after a lot of try and error is that we heard the uh, infotainment system running, but there's no display screen, right? So, and especially like buying from secondhand parts store or eBay, you, you're not sure if it's working or not. <laughs> so, we went through a lot of hassle, and finally, we managed to find out that um, it's actually we are missing the campus wake up signal. Yeah. So um, similarly to Bench 2, we had a similar, uh, similarly the campus wake up signal in order to properly turn on the infotainment system um, and receive some visual feedback from the system itself. Uh, in this, we have actually two ways of doing so. One way is to fast our way out to find the CAT IDs, but of course this will not work in, the, in this case, right, because we don't have any engine and all. So what we did is we actually rented a vehicle um, we noticed that when you turn on the vehicle, there is some messages that are being sent continuously. So, sorry to the poor vehicle, we turn it on and off multiple times <laughs> just to capture that. And finally, we managed to narrow it down to these three uh, can, specific CAN IDs and messages that you need to send simultaneously at one go so that it will actually turn on. Yeah. It, um, as compared to, like, for example, other vehicles like Hyundai, Honda and stuff, you don't really need all of this. But I think for Honda, you might need coding. If not, it will not turn on too. Yeah. So after powering up Bench 3, we immediately faced, we were faced with another challenge, uh, which is anti-tap. 
So after a short while of playing on the canvas and injecting whatever chem messages that we have, um, we quickly found out that we have a pop-up screen that says NT-TEF production activated. Please switch the ignition engine on and restart the system. So uh, after a quick research, we found that there is actually three levels, different levels of NT-TEF. Uh, we were lucky that we got level A and not level B and C. So um, what we did for level A is uh, what was written there, but in this case we don't have any engine, right? How to return the ignition on and off. Uh, so what we did was we uh, turned off the bench and started simulating the whole cycle of the vehicle um, starting because we had the can messages to do that. So we started uh, playing the messages continuously and afterwards it managed to resolve our error. So for level B and level C itself, uh, we realized that level B requires the developer's assistance to remove the error messages because due to a big mismatch. Uh, big mismatch, it means that if you have multiple components that are from different vehicles, when you try to buy an aftermarket part or if a part is faulty, you buy it from another vehicle, you put it in, um, the vehicle doesn't recognize that it as its own. So think of it like a, your own national ID, right? So um, it requires developers and systems to retrieve and move it. And then level C, it sounds the worst. Um, this uh, will also be activated if you keep on uh, injecting uh, the camera messages repeatedly without uh, ignoring the uh, system. So it will, it might force you um, to stop your car in the middle of the road. <laughs> you see, like some of the people saying it on the forums, like, you know, please consult your workshop. You will shut the whole signal completely. You can't drive your car. That's what we saw. I haven't tested it yet. I don't really intend to. <laughs> so uh, we were very lucky that we got a message. Yeah, so um, um, next up, we have identifying the attaching through the whole test bench. So uh, for this bench tree, we actually identified the attack chain um, that we can actually uh, pick the attack vector through the inputting browser. And then uh, through the browser vulnerability, you can actually do an RCE to compromise the inputting system. And um, subsequently, if you want to uh, retain access, you can actually plan a backdoor uh, after you get real access for future testing. And then if you want to go in further, you have to do lateral movement to um, move into the vehicle's canvas and try to connect to it. So actually, the attack chain methodology is very similar to what we have for bench to outside. Yeah. So next up, we have the comparison of bench two and three side by side. So um, of course, we uh, we see from the bench two, you have your custom meter on the top, and you have the infotainment system at the bottom. For bench three, you have both um, side of them side by side with each other. So a fun fact, uh, that is why it's more expensive for bench three. <laughs> that custom that piece of um, frame um, when I asked it from the manufacturer, it cost like. Five thousand sing dollars just for that piece of thing, and I was like, oh, "Okay, thank you, thank you for the time. <laughs> I'm gonna get a, get a second hand." Yeah. But um, it's uh, digital, that's why. Right. Yeah. And then um, similar for bench through uh, this is the inputting system. You have a knob that's uh, the uh, ZBE they call it. So it's to control the inputting system um, through like, scrolling and stuff. Similarly for bench three so we have that as well over here. Um, there's an option to buy like small little spare parts, but I'm like, I don't know what, I'm just going to get a whole big thing. <laughs> I managed to buy it, uh, so lucky for us. Um, and then, uh, so this uh, the side-by-side -side comparison, but I would say the architecture is fairly similar to each other, which I'll go up next. So, um, through hands-on like, research and reading of these two test benches, we found out that you know, the architectures are pretty similar to each other. And on top of bench, uh, on top we have actually bench two's architecture, bottom bench three's architecture. Um, we noticed that uh, both of them have central gateway modules, but they are named differently. So for bench two is named as uh, ZGW, so it's also central gateway, but in a German um, written manner. So that's why it's called ZGW. Uh, EIS gateway, which that piece I mentioned earlier, uh, that's for this. Uh, they perform similar functionalities. They do whitelisting of messages through IP tables. Um, they connect to various canvas connections, for example, diagnostics, power training, heat unit canvas. And we, we see that the heat unit uh, has both Wi Fi capabilities and uh, also uh, capabilities to perform uh, OTA, which is over the air uh, transmission. 
Um, I'm not sure here in the Philippines is OTA allowed, but in Singapore it is actually not allowed and it's governed by the government because they are worried that you know some people may trans uh, meet like uh, hijack the signal yeah, uh, in the middle and send malicious uh, firmware to real legal updates. Yeah. Oh really? Oh, nice. Okay, so they come here more <laughs> So uh, then next we see that uh, uh, the telematics, um, which is known for both uh, cars, is um, the TCB, which is the telematics communication box for the bench tool, and uh, T-box or a mess, not a bag, brand, <laughs> or a bench tree that connects to the heat unit, uh, which enables the embedded 4G LTE connection. So it has an embedded SIM card in it. So for the uh, Ethernet switch for bench two, uh, it has a physical Ethernet switch, but for bench three, it's really embedded into the um, uh, entertainment system itself. So there's direct connection to it. Um, then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's CAN bus message filtration done at the central gateway. So um, initially, we didn't know about this uh, filtration thing. Um, because most of us were in automotive industry previously. So what we did was we actually connected our OBD2 cable to the uh, bench 2 speaker, the one we rented. We started sending CAN messages and stuff, and we were like, how is the messages all disappearing? Like, there's no, we, there's limited information that we can see from the OBD2 port, except for like some uh, very limited messages, as if that we don't have the whole car moving. So, um, like this measure earlier, we did a man in the middle attack. So what we did is completely bypass the gateway and started injecting the messages directly into the vehicle. But that itself requires physical connection. So if you manage to change the attack through a remote vector, then it's going to be very dangerous because you can connect directly to the critical components of the vehicle. So after noticing, we noticed that there's no stark differences um, as uh, in the both arch architectures, except for their naming conventions and also the technologies being used. Okay, so up next we have the summary of our learnings. So um, through bench, through um, uh, I, I think there were a lot of questions out there as well, like how do you prevent these can bus attacks, like can injection attacks, right? Um, we realized that a lot of canvas uh, they are using legacy can, so there's no message signing properties. So we did um, feedback this to the developer, the using uh, the manufacturer. He said that you know message signing is very expensive to implement, but they will be implementing it on your future vehicles. And um, once you're in the uh, canvas, let's say you don't uh, you don't have message signing properties, you can actually you know, simulate the wake up signal like what we did and um, masquerade yourself as another ECU because the ECU can't tell whether if you are legitimate or not. So you can actually send it across and make it do the actions that you want it to perform. Um, so uh, the good thing is that you know with the central gateway, uh, unless you go and read up on the writing diagram of the vehicle, uh, most people will not bypass the central gateway because it's really a uh, deterrence, I would say. So it uh, most of the unwanted can messages can be filtered away, like the firewall. Yeah. So in our case for bench three, uh, for the canvas effects, we have anti tap activated. Yeah. So for bench two on newer vehicles, there is also um, anti tap as well. Uh, we quickly realized that they implemented the anti-tap on their newer vehicles as well. So, um, the bench tree learnings and challenges, uh, we found out that the implementation of anti-tap entry makes it very challenging for us to actually build bench tree. Because if you want to remove the anti-tap permanently, it's an extremely complicated task. Unless you manage to locate and uh, refresh uh, one of the NAND chips in there, um, to remove anti tap because what we wanted to do is wanted to do that because we, I, I don't want to do the anti tap messages anymore. But we um, were advised against it because we might break the board and it's not cheap like this. We sell at five thousand dollars something now. Like, oh, we like to pay that. <laughs> yeah. So um, another way is what we have seen uh, from uh, Kim Lab's research is that you uh, can get good access. Uh, we flash the whole firmware. You patch it in, so you can actually remove the anti tap. Um, but I will rec actually recommend the second method instead of the first method of doubling with the hardware itself. But, um, so so far from what we can see, if you get a level A kind of message, or AD, uh, it doesn't really hinder our progress much. It's just that it's very annoying to get by with. So um, 
Moving on, we have already five test bench disputes. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> but um, we, we actually have seven. Um, we have six and seven that is uh, currently in the midst of building. Yeah, so hopefully uh, in the future we can bring it over to you guys and let you see. Um, the problem with three and four is that yeah, the Pelican case is actually three times the size of what you see outside here. Yeah. So um, it's a logistical nightmare to bring over. Um, we didn't even know that the issue was like 18 kg. <laughs> yeah. So I, mean, I actually thought that it was like 10 kg and then we bought the uh, wrong luggage size for it. Yeah. But anyway, um, as we give up our continuous efforts, right? Um, we actually uh, we actually do more tests than building like telematics, remote attacks, key for uh, ECU testing, and also well such channel attacks such as bleaching. Yeah. So we're also looking into electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles as well, uh, including architectures. So um, thank you so much for staying, and I hope you guys are still awake. I know I'm just one session between you and the parties, but I hope you guys enjoy my session. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask us. Questions? Yeah. When you were talking about getting on the um, automotive Ethernet, mm -hmm. did you have a special? I mean, is there a special box that you bought for that? So we, we didn't really go um, and tap in the automotive Ethernet per se. I actually connected to the central gateway directly and I actually realized that uh, there is the automotive Ethernet being present in there apart from the wiring diagrams. Yeah, so that's how we found out that the system is constantly being tracked by the manufacturer as well. Um, we actually asked the manufacturer um, on why they do that. It's because there's a lot of cars have outside and it's also to prevent uh, people from stealing cars and selling the parts illegally. Hence, when you log into like um, the vehicle, it has an IP address locked on there, but it's the reason for tracking for anti theft, which makes it a lot difficult to uh, enter the systems. But um, that itself is not really the internet, it's more of their own internal login page from the central gateway module. Yeah. And it's made by one of the tier one manufacturers. They had the logo one tier as well. <laughs> yeah. You had to. I'm losing my voice. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, you had to buy a special piece. It's not like you have an RJ45 port. No, you had no. to buy a special piece of hardware. Piece of, yeah, hardware to do that. Um, okay. So what we did was uh, we had another equipment vector. Uh, so we were using uh, Vector to uh, oh, okay. yeah, plug it in and uh, I can't remember if we bought the Ethernet module for it because I did buy the Canvas and uh, CanFD. So CanFD is an extended uh, version of Canvas. But uh, I think Vector also supports Ethernet as well, directly plugging in. Yeah. Forgive me, I mean, it's three years ago. I can't really remember much. <laughs> I can't <try to> remember. <laughs> So I, I think Intrepid has one that supports it as well, I think, for Neo P or something, yeah. Yeah, Refire, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so at the beginning, when you started speaking the messages, telecoms, you used OBD to just listen to what's happening in the numbers? Yeah, that's right, that's that right. Yeah, that, that's what we did. So you started? So, yeah, that's how we started. Um, actually, we, we also bought components as well. Uh, we only could rent the vehicle when we uh, fell into like, troubles, trying to locate like different messages, right? But uh, how we actually started was that we went all put in money to buy, to go to the scrapyard and get whatever we have from there. Um, we didn't even have the wiring diagrams. So what we did is we did a very, very black box and ancient approach. We went into every single port and started testing using a multimeter to test for the like the voltage, the impedance and stuff, to see which ones can high and can low. So it took us a long time. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, everything is just so loosely placed on the table. Yeah, so um, we decided to put everything on like a wooden board, like a plank. Yeah, and afterwards we decided that that won't cut it as well. So we bought like boxes, like medical cases, and all. Uh, we decided to increase our budget. <laughs> yeah. 
So, um, Pelican cases are still the most trustworthy. Um, yeah. Boxes, I would say. Yeah. 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 I remember I was wiring up um, some of the initial switch for our first test bench, and I was just there wiring, and then everybody just took like a five steps back, and I was like, I'm not going to explore anything, why are you guys so far away from me? Yeah, but that's how much you didn't trust me in your wiring. Um, I, and we were doing a bench to one of the eagle um, earlier, right? Uh, it's, it's a funny joke, if you guys don't mind me saying. Um, so what I did, like this particular, oh, sorry, um, this, yeah, this vehicle. So what we did was the man made in the middle attack, right? I was rewiring the um, the car, trying to get into the camera system. So what I did was when I turned it on, I was like, why is the wipers turned on? <laughs> and um, so this guy came over and checked. He was like, oh yeah, you rewired the whole thing the opposite way. <laughs> So the, the, wire, the wipers turned on because it's actually uh, it went into an emergency mode because everything was connected wrongly. So I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, yeah. So a lot of these mistakes that I make, but you know, thankfully we didn't spoil anything. Uh, I, this was a rental vehicle, uh, so I returned it back to the rental company. It's, it's just that it, because of us turning on and off too many times, so we had the engine feels a bit iffy. <laughs> I didn't dare to tell them what I did, but yeah, we had, we had to do what we had to do. Yeah. If you don't mind sharing yes. the brands of the cars you tried with? Like yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Hyundai? Yeah, yeah, Hyundai. No. Uh, we, we tried outside ASA Hyundai, and this is actually BMW. a BMW. Um, we did Honda, uh, Toyota, uh, Tesla. Uh, yeah, I uh, and which one was it? BMW, Volvo. Volvo. Oh, yeah. I think we did Volvo once on the key yeah, fob yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, attacks. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Some of the brands that we have tested, uh, uh, not Kia, but yeah, these these are some of the components that we have tested right now. Do you observe the same branding or same kind of internal components for? You know, same brand like Audi and Volkswagen probably might have similar stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, sister companies. You know? Sister companies, yes. Uh, I, yeah, I believe that they might have similar design. Um, you see that Bench 2 and 3 design is similar, is yeah. because um, I understood from the manufacturer that uh, this is back order, right? <laughs> I can't say too much. <laughs> but anyway, um, you, you have names, right? uh, anyway, yeah, but they, they have similar designers. <laughs> they have similar designers, yeah. Obvious. Yeah, yeah. So, so that is why um, you see a lot of similar designs in there. They may make a little bit of um, twitch to be for it to be different. Like I understand that for like brand A, um, we have better parts compared to brand, <laughs> brand B. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So brand B, um, some parts of brand B spoils more easily. Yeah, compared to brand A. Yeah, that's what I understand. But it, it might be a myth. I am. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I know Brand B has a lot of gearbox issues. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. How do you simulate the uh, When we rented the um, vehicle itself, we actually captured a range of messages and we replayed it on the vehicle. So we, we were reversing, narrowing it down, saying that okay, I have like five, six messages, uh, these are my suspected components. We did it a very silly way, we started removing it one by one. <laughs> yeah, we shot words and all. So, uh, and then we managed to narrow it down to these three particular messages that we sent continuously. Because like, for example, if you need to activate some certain parts, some things might need to be like closed or something. Like for example, if you want to activate the sunroof, it need to be like, um, you know, it's, some things need to be closed some, for some vehicles, yeah. So we started doing this one by one. Um, 
what we notice is that the you know, even though like for bench two for their particular manufacturer itself, um, the even for the newer cars they were using a lot of legacy can. So the can messages are pretty similar. Uh, the IDs per se, the can IDs, but the message box at the back sometimes they change. Yeah, they do update a little bit, but the IDs are the same. Yeah. So um, unless they completely change the hardware, but sometimes manufacturers still fall back to their own legacy can because it was easier for them to implement. It does not make sense for them to change their IDs completely. But if we were to talk about um, different car brands, like maybe say Honda and Hyundai, of course they have different IDs completely that mean different items. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. So when you go to tuning uh, workshops or and stuff, when the tuner plugs in their device to the OB2 D2 system, it, the, you realize that they can access because their software actually automatically uh, unlocks, they have the key to unlock your ECU. That is why they can actually tune your vehicle. But if you don't have the key, like let's say if you prompt um, the vehicle you're plugged in like this, right, you can need to actually crack the security access code before uh, unlocking it. So that's why your tuners charge you so much for the money, apart from the skills <laughs> for the FUO ratio. But uh, of course, the software itself needs to unlock the ECU. If not, it will not be able to access that critical component itself, especially like um, uh, brakes, uh, tur tur I'm talking about, I say turbo charge, right? Like the turbos and stuff, you need um, the correct FUO ratio. So you need to, um, the software will actually un automatically unlock the key. So um, even like for example, uh, if your car has an issue like engine check light or something, you bring it to the vehicle workshop, the mechanic plugs in his device directly inside. That software also contains the security unlock key to unlock your vehicle's stuff. Yeah. That, that is why um, some manufacturers actually charge these workshops uh, subscription fees to actually uh, maintain that code base and stuff to unlock that vehicle. Because sometimes they have multiple software updates. They may change stuff and they may patch stuff as well. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Did you have a chance to explore the mobile apps which are able to you know remotely uh, check yeah. the location of your car? Or, you know, so yeah. That's another angle we, you have a tech surface. Where yeah, yeah. Oh, we, we, haven't, we haven't really done that yet. But that will be next on our list. And also EV charging stations. Like, yeah, I mean, it's like up and coming, right? So that's one of the vectors that we want to look at as well. Um, but definitely it's very interesting. It seems like um, there is a research uh, released by Sam Curry, the uh, very famous researcher in Germany, right, on the mobile applications and so the party applications that are able to hack into vehicles. And uh, yeah, that's one of the things that we are looking at as well. Um, unfortunately, there's only so many of us and <laughs> we have multiple test ventures. So we are, we are trying to narrow down our research and also trying to juggle our day jobs as well. Yeah. But yeah, I will definitely want to try that. <laughs> you won't have to purchase any of these things. So. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right, that's true. That's true, the mobile, right? Yeah. But I also need a car. I can borrow one. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Shall I release you guys to the parties? <laughs> what is the parties? Oh, yeah, so I have announcements. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, one more question? Sure. Okay. So. Yeah, uh, so if you